Strings and supersymmetry 1. There's another video about BRST quantization of the superstring that you might want to see before this one, but a lot of students want to see the motivations first, so this is what I do here. In the bosonic string, we found these lowest level states. Quantum state for the tachyon looked like this, and its vertex operator was that. The photon this, with this vertex operator, and so on. The non-abelian engaged bosons, and the graviton. We also had some other states that we weren't quite sure necessarily what they were, but what we're sure about is we need some matter. We don't have any space-time fermions at this point, and we sure don't want the tachyon, which is bad in the bosonic string. It turns out that simply introducing free fermions psi on the world sheet gives us supersymmetry, space-time fermions, and removes the tachyon. I emphasize these as a motivation, so this was sort of a side effect from this point of view. Let's go through that. But it's actually simpler to start with a simpler example. So in Schwartz's QFT book, for example, he has a very nice introduction to what he calls Schwinger's proper time formalism, which is related to this formalism. So take this usual diagram in uh, QED. Notice two things. This photon is an external state here, and this has a spinner index. The claim here, for example, in this nice review, is that you can write this as a 0 plus 1 dimensional theory on this world line, where you just put in these vertex operators v in your functional integrals over these world line fields. So let's try this. The vertex operators are of this form. It's explained in this review why they have this form in QED. Free action x dot squared and psi dot psi. With this functional integral and transforming to this variable u here, rescaling with t and setting tau 2 to 0, I get this vacuum polarization. The vacuum polarization is just like the usual expression. This combination we get turns out to be just the derivative of the bosonic Green's function on this world line squared minus the fermionic Green's function squared. And the latter here is just 1. You can understand the u as a distance between two vertex operators. So it gives, if you want, an interpretation to the Feynman parameter formalism. And indeed, both Feynman and Schwinger use formalism like this in their original papers in quantum field theory. As Schubert emphasizes, the spin degrees of freedom here could be incorporated either by explicit gamma matrices as we're used to here, or by Grassmann variables on the world line, which carry the same algebraic properties. So we did not put a spinner index on this psi. There's one here, but we get the same result. The world line supersymmetry, that I haven't really explained what it is yet, comes as a free gift. All we did was put free bosons and fermions on the world line, and world line supersymmetry in regular QED without space-time supersymmetry comes as a free gift. So let's try to understand that. So we take the usual Polakov action, we put the alpha here that was outside before, now we put it here, so we can easily add these word sheet fermions. They're free. So we can add one psi of z and one psi tilde of z bar, as we will see. Now, these are actually single component. Let's try to understand that. You might want to pause and take a look at this appendix. It's a nice explanation, especially look in table B1, where he lists spinner representations in various dimensions. So in D equals 2, what does it mean to be Majorana while? Well, the Dirac spinner has two complex components in two dimensions. Now, if we split these in half, we get while spinners that each have one complex component. And now we impose also the Majorana condition, and we get one real spinner, which is this object here. So it's a real spinner on the world sheet. Notice that in space-time it doesn't have a spinner index, just a vector index, just like these had a vector index. But from the internal world sheet point of view, this is just a label of capital D different fermions that each have one real component. Again, there's no spinner index suppressed here. There's only a single component. So what is supersymmetry now? I just introduced a free theory of bosons and fermions. So let's first think about global supersymmetry. A supersymmetry is a symmetry with a symmetry parameter, which is Grassmann, so it's anti-commuting. To check that the super Polakov action has global supersymmetry is pretty easy, but I'd like to take this opportunity to advertise Kadabra, which is the, this beautiful tool that's available to us. So you can put in the action like this. It's a slightly different convention than I had, but you, I think you see the point, where these are worksheet fermions. And then you vary it using the vary command. You partially integrate collect terms, and you see that there's a symmetry that looks like this. The symmetry is x varies into psi, and psi varies into del x. Like with different translations, we now go from the global symmetry to any holomorphic Grassmann parameter. This gives a binary term, it's a very useful exercise to compute this, the binary term is a supercurrent. So by the Noether procedure we get a holomorphic current whose contour integrals gives us the charges associated with the symmetry. Similarly this one for the anti-holomorphic fermion. But it's important to keep this distinction. World sheet supersymmetry does not automatically give space-time supersymmetry. For sure it didn't in world line QED. QED is not supersymmetric in space-time, but just having this free theory of bosons and fermions on the world sheet gave us world line supersymmetry in that case. 
let's understand what is actually the symmetry in string theory when you put super Polyakov instead of Polyakov. As discussed in the other video, there are two sectors in the superstring. There's the Ramon sector and there's the Nevers Schwartz sector. The Ramon sector, the states are labeled by these spin eigenvalues. There are five of them. So you have two to the five equals 32 components. You can split them into 16 wild fermions plus 16 prime wild fermions. And both of these are Majorana. These can take either value plus minus one half. So you have 32 combinations. So you have these big spinners in 10 dimensions. There's a constraint from BRST quantization from the zero mode of the TF supercurrent that gives you the space-time Dirac equations. And this restricts, for example, to the eight left chiral spinner in 10 dimensions, which transforms properly on the Lil group as befits a massless spinner representation in 10 dimensions. So to summarize, we have an eight left chiral spinner is one possible representation. There's also one for the right chiral spinner. And there's also the space-time vector. Why it should be a psi here and not dx like we have for the vector in bosonic string is discussed in the other video. From this, we get an eight vector as a representation of the little group SO8 in 10 dimensions. We can tensor this left mover with this right mover and get a closed string state that is an eight V times eight. That's called a gravitino state. The physicality condition for this gravitino state is what gives us supersymmetry in space-time. So let's do this real quick. The physical cohomology you divide out the exact states. The exact state here from BRST quantization will give us a shift in the U polarization, which is a vector spinner. And this is the usual space-time derivative for a local symmetry. And this corresponds to a charge in space-time, which is the supersymmetry. So this classifies how many of these states we have. In type 2a, we have uh, 16 plus 16 prime, chiral and antichiral. Type 1 string theory is to take one of these, divide out the worksheet parity operation, which actually forces you to add D brains to give you open strings. So type one theory has open and closed strings, whereas these two theories only have closed strings. So sort of only a gravitational sec. And we'll come back to later that actually these theories secretly also have D brains. So total crampification then gives maximal supersymmetry in D equals four. If you compactify the low energy limit of string theory in 10 dimensions, the open string theory will give you N equals one super mills by 10 dimensional counting. Compactifying on six dimensional torus gives you n equals 4 in 4 dimensions, simply because a supersymmetry in 10 dimensions has 16 components, is Majorana while, and that corresponds to 4 times 4 components, which is 4 Majorana spinners in 4 dimensions. Now what's special about this theory? Why do I say this is harmonic oscillator? It's like a toy model. In particle physics, we usually want the couplings to run, but here the beta function is identically zero. That's an interesting feature, but it's maybe not such a useful feature. For example, if you want to understand QCD. Couplings should also be chiral if you want to describe the standard model. The standard model has chiral gauge couplings. For example, the left-handed quark is a 2 under SU2, when the right-handed quark is not. This turns out to be consistent with extended supersymmetry like n equals 4, because then the supercharge commutes with the gauge charge. There are many other uses of n equals 4. One should not emphasize too much these specifics of particle physics. But even for those, it could be useful to go beyond this very basic harmonic oscillator n equals 4. So we need to break supersymmetry. By some deformation in the extra dimensions, we can break these 16 down to, for example, 4, which would be the minimal supersymmetry in four dimensions. This theory might be a richer theory then. So let's briefly go through how we get to something that more closely resembles usual particle physics. We can either compactify on some curve space. We can consider d brains or orbifolds or antifolds. Let's pick an orbifold. Compactification from 10 dimensions to 4 dimensions, you impose a condition to preserve minimal supersymmetry, as discussed in another video. This condition corresponds to the holonomy, the group that you get from parallel transporting a vector around the extra dimensions, and the condition is that it should be an SU3, not the generic situation, which is SO6. And the simple model I had was that you do that by, for example, identifying by rotation of 120 degrees. Identification makes a cone, has non-trivial holonomy, and the orbifold operator is something that acts on complexified combination of coordinates with this phase. Here, V1 is a third, so that corresponds to 120 degree rotations. Here's a sample n equals 1 orbifold, and I will say now what it means for it to be n equals 1. Assume that the orbifold operator theta acts separately in these three internal two tori. What I mean by that is take the complex structure here to be e to the pi i third, i e to the pi i third as an example and then we're going to put conditions on these real fractional numbers here i've already assumed that the point group is in u3 instead of so6 because we haven't allowed general so6 rotations of these we only allowed rotations within each complex plane that gives you torus the overflow action on a space-time spinner now you divide your spinner labels into external and internal so you act on a supercharge by this phase, where V is the vector of V1, V2, V3, and S are these three. If you as an example set these equal, 
You see that then this will be invariant. This face will be one, and that keeps this supercharge. So projecting onto invariant states removes non-invariant supersymmetry generators and leaves minimal supersymmetry in four dimensions. There's a nice list of these in Blumenhagen Lewis Tyson. A nice example is Z6 prime. They stick these values, they sum to zero. So we're in SU3 and we keep one supersymmetry in four dimensions. So it's a very interesting question then how to usually spontaneously break supersymmetry completely. But here I just want to argue how to get to minimal supersymmetry. I would also like to end by reminding you that we started by super polyca, which is a free theory. So supersymmetry in space-time came upon us and we have now generalized a little bit the compactification to get to minimal supersymmetry. The thing that we got sort of for free in Schubert's words was the maximal supersymmetry from the four-dimensional point of view.